Okay, here we are. We're going to talk today about is revival biblical? And uh, if you can probably hear in the background, it's very, very windy today, so we're not going to be up on the mountain up top there. We're actually down a little bit below, uh, hopefully cut down on some of the wind. But So please excuse any kind of wind noise that you might hear. But uh, two weeks ago, I talked about logic versus emotion. And in that sermon, uh, I talked about revival and how that revival is not scriptural. And I've had some emails and things and people kind of ask questions, well, what do you mean revival is not scriptural? You know, could you clarify? So that's what this sermon is going to be about today, the subject of revival. Okay, so we're going to start out here with Webster's 1828 Dictionary definition of the word revival. There are four definitions. First of all, you have Return, recall, or recovery to life from death or apparent death as the revival of a drowned person. Return and recall to activity from a state of languor as the revival of spirits. That's the second one. Third one, recall, return, or recovery from a state of neglect, oblivion, obscurity, or depression as the revival of letters or learning. Okay, and fourth, you have renewed and more active attention to religion and awakening of men to their spiritual concerns. Now that would be the one that most people would think of. They would think of Christians having experiencing revival, um, getting reinterested in the in the things of the Lord and being getting fired up to do things for the Lord. So that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. Now let me just say this: I do believe in revival, and you're, I'm going to, but I'm going to show you the kind of revival that is scriptural. All right. A lot of times, I have one of my errors that I have my problems is I oftentimes say things and I think people understand what's in up here in my head. I don't always communicate correctly. And so a lot of times I'll say something thinking you, the viewer, understands what's up here. And sometimes you don't. <laughs> a lot of times you don't. So that's why I'm going to clarify this uh, in this study tonight. Okay. Or not tonight, but today. So let's start out here. I'm going to show you the very first type and most important type of revival that you will have in your life that any man or woman will have. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 2 is where we'll start our study today. Ephesians chapter 2 starting at verse 1. This is going to be tricky today. It's really, really, really windy out here. Blowing my Bible all over the place. Ah. Sorry about that. I'm trying to see where I'm to read to here, according to my notes. Okay. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Let me stop there for just a second. You remember the first definition in Webster's 1828 Dictionary for revival? Recovery to life from death. So as a lost person, you are dead in trespasses and sins. And when you get saved, you are quickened. You are made alive. Verse 2, Ephesians 2, verse 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. That's the, God's description of the lost. They are children of wrath. It's not that God is the father, you know, the brotherhood of men and the fatherhood of God and all this Masonic stuff. Uh-uh. If you're lost, God's your enemy. You're a child of wrath. You need to get that. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. So the quickening does not come until you get saved. Verse 6, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, when you get saved, 
you experience the very first form of revival. You are dead and you are brought to life. Okay? And we're going to talk about that new life. You see, because there's an awful lot of people out there that are dead. And they're still in their sins. Even though they claim to have the new life. The new birth. We're going to talk about that. But the, the sad fact of the matter is, I'll say this here, I have this point written out. The sad fact of the matter is there's a lot of people that are calling for revival that have never experienced that first revival from the dead. There's a lot of people that are still dead in trespasses and sins. They've never been born again. And they're calling, oh, we need, mighty, we need a mighty revival in our land. We need to have revival in our land. And yet they haven't even been revived from their dead state as children of wrath. Very sad. Turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm going to show you this thing about being born again. John chapter 3 verse 1 through 7. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. This guy was thinking that Jesus was speaking physically. He wasn't speaking physically. He was speaking spiritually. Okay? And if you are saved then you have experienced a new birth. And people get all excited about me preaching a new birth and a new creature in Christ Jesus. And they say, you know, you're judging people and you're, you're teaching Lordship Salvation and things like this. And I get that all the time, even though I speak against Lordship Salvation, you know, but I get this thing all the time. Oh, you're preaching Lordship Salvation, blah, 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 because I say that there's supposed to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. I quote scripture and, I'm, I'm, and people say I'm, Preaching false doctrine. Okay, you know, whatever. The fact of the matter is, you have to be born again. And if you claim that you're a Christian, and years and years, I, I understand when somebody first gets saved, there's going to be carnal issues, there's going to be issues of sin that they struggle with. Sure, we all do that. But I'm talking about somebody that's been saved for years and years and years, and there's never been a change. There's never been that new creature in Christ Jesus. They're still the old man. They look like the world. They talk like the world. They act like the world. And they react like the world when you preach to them. But I'm supposed to believe that they're saved because they profess to be saved. Wrong. If a man is in Christ Jesus, he will be a new creature. You have to be born again. There must be a new creature birth. You pass from the old life of saying, I'll do what I feel like doing, I'll live in my sin, to now you have to go and come before God and you say, okay, now that I'm a Christian, what do you want me to do? Okay? The Holy Spirit of truth comes in, there has to be a change there, a changed life. Can you be saved and keep the old man of sin around? Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Now this is a good chapter here. Romans chapter 6. And this is about your death as a Christian. Okay? When you get saved, you have to die. The old man can't live. The old man can't have, you know, a place in your life. You have to bury him. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. 
What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You say, well, then you'll be sinlessly perfect. I didn't say that. It's talking about a continuous lifestyle of sin here is what's going on. And you get these people that profess to be saved and they're just living in sin, just continuous and they have no victory over it and there's just, there's no change. And you try to preach the truth to them, they get angry at you. But they're saved, right? Uh-huh. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now you see what the apostate does, what the carnal Christian, what they'll do is it say, they'll say, you see it says, should walk not must walk. You, you know, shouldn't you be a little bit worried about a movement, a system of belief that says, let's take a lighter attitude towards sin? I mean, you really think that I'm going to get up there to heaven and the Lord's going to say at the judgment seat of Christ, hey, you did a good job, but I just wish you wouldn't have been so hard on sin. Right. You should walk in newness of life. If you have not experienced any kind of a change since you've been saved, then you're, you know, you really need to examine yourself. That's why Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and he said, examine yourselves whether they be in the faith. Why was he saying that? Because he was writing to the most carnal group of people out there. And Paul wrote time and time again, lest ye have believed in vain, lest ye have believed in vain, unless my labor was in vain with you. Paul is saying, hey, did I waste my time on you? There's not much of a change there. Maybe you aren't really saved. That's in the Bible. And I get called a heretic for doing that. It's ridiculous. But let's continue. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. i got to stop there again. There's so many good verses in this, in this chapter here. Okay? Your old man is destroyed with, when you get saved, with Jesus Christ. Jesus became sin for you on the cross. And let me just tell you this. There's not one sin out there that you can't get victory over. And you say, then I can get victory over all my sins and never struggle again. No. You're always going to struggle, but the point is, if you have a struggle, you can fight that thing. And you're going to, you know, you replace one sin, you'll have a problem in some other area, because that's the nature of your flesh. But what I'm talking about here, the people that I say that I question whether they're saved or not, are these people that hate the King James Bible, that totally attack Bible doctrine, they look like the world, they dress worldly, you know, they listen to worldly music, and then they get mad when you rebuke them for it. Okay? These are the people I'm talking about. I'm not talking about some King James Bible believing Christian that has a problem with pornography, or that smokes occasionally, or something like that. I'm not talking about them. Those are still sins. Very, very serious sins. But if you're working on things and trying to, and you can say, this is the way I was before I got saved, and now I changed. After I got saved, things changed for me. Then you're saved. Okay? But if you can say, I got saved over here, and I just lived the same way, and I don't get convicted about things, and, and then you're lost. It's just as simple as that. Verse 7. Now he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There you see the revival again. Okay, You were dead, and now you're alive. Through who? through Jesus Christ. Verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. 
Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, but ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which, del which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Read this whole chapter. It's old man versus new man. I'm not a heretic for preaching this. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? It's right there. Old man of sin that's dead, spiritually dead, you get saved, and now you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. And you don't serve sin anymore. I'm real sorry for you if you're trying to justify your sins. If you've got some kind of a perversion problem, or you've got some kind of a, a rebellious spirit to you or something like that, and you want to try and justify that, and say, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm just a carnal Christian, I'm just having problems. You need to get rid of those sins in your life. All right? And, you know, I had to come to a point in time in my life where I had to really examine myself and see if I was even saved. And I don't believe I was. For a long, long time that I thought I was a Christian, I believe I was a false convert. And I had moral convictions, by the way, that whole time that I was a false convert. But I wasn't really born again. I really couldn't read this book right here and, ha and say I have anything in common with the people in the book. I really couldn't compare my life to that of Paul, who is supposed to be our example, by the way. I really couldn't compare myself to his life or to the lives of other Christians down through the centuries. I was very, very worldly. And I had to realize I wasn't really born again. I was a false convert for a long time. But when I finally came to the Lord and really truly got saved, my life changed. And if there's not been a change in your life after your conversion, you need to get saved. And people say, that's Lordship salvation. Okay, smarty, let me just ask you a question. Could you please provide a definition where the words Lordship salvation are used in the King James Bible? And show me that it lines up with what I just said. Show me the term Lordship Salvation. Just give you a little hint. It's not in there. See, Lordship Salvation is kind of like trying to nail Jello down. It wiggles and moves and stuff like that. And you're not going to get the nail in the same place every time. You say, what are you talking about? Well, Lordship Salvation could be whatever you make it. You know, I can go to this guy and you can say, you know, you're Calvinistic, so you believe that the Holy Spirit convicts a man and gets him to change and cleans up his life and then repentance is granted. See, that's what Lordship Salvation really is. You know, it's part of Calvinism. That's what I learned. Okay, and that is heresy. To teach that the Holy Spirit comes down and gets you to clean your whole life up and then you're granted salvation. That's heresy. But what these modern Christians have done is they come along and they say no if you teach that you have to change your life after you get saved and you have to be convicted of sin before salvation and say oh boy God have mercy on me a sinner they say then that's Lordship salvation you see they've taken the definition a real definition which is part of Calvinism and then they move it over here to true Bible believing Christianity hey let me ask you a question by the way out there for you those of you out there 
because I'm getting sick and tired of this whole thing and I'm teaching work salvation and all this other nonsense. Let me just ask you a question. If the lost world cannot have conviction over sin, then why do they resist the gospel? I know lost people right now that refuse to be saved because they know it's going to mean a changed life. They know what it's going to cost them. See? See, the easy believism is you just come along and you pray the prayer, then you're in, and then you can change at some point in, in the future when you feel comfortable changing. You know? That's what it is. There's no conviction of sin. Why then did Jesus come and say, I called sinners to repentance? That doesn't make any sense if the sinner can't understand that they are a sinner and that they need to change their lives. The whole system is rotten and corrupt. And these people that attack me and other Bible-believing ministries out there and say, you're preaching Lordship Salvation because I say repentance is part of salvation. Those people there are on the shelf and God's not using them and they're getting upset and trying to come and take people away from a Bible-believing ministry and trying to backstab somebody. I'm getting sick and tired of it. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, you knew I was going there, didn't you? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 14. You see, that revival, that first revival has to come to you. You have to go from that dead old man of sin and become a new creature in Christ Jesus. We're going to see it here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Verse 17, Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And I've given this example before. David Spurgeon, a brother right now, it's traveling around the country, he goes and he speaks different places. He was, I think, second in command of the Outlaws Motorcycle Gang. Tattooed, doing drugs, alcohol, getting in fights all the time. He got busted for drugs, went to federal prison, and there he got saved. And he came out and he went right back to the outlaws and went back to drug dealing and alcohol and fighting in bars, right? Oh, but he witnessed along the way, you see. He kept his long hair and he kept his leather and everything else and his Harley Davidson motorcycles and he went and still was part of the outlaws. Because all it is is just a, a prayer that you pray and then you're in. You're a Christian now because you say you're a Christian. No, David Spurgeon left his life of sin. He left it. He is a new creature. Okay? I'll even put up a picture. Here's his track that he puts out. Right there it is. Do they look like the same man? No. He's a new creature in Christ Jesus. But if he would have gone and looked like the old man that he used to be, I'd say the man's lost. I'd say he's not truly saved. Why? Because of the standards of Scripture. Go next to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 20 through 24. Sorry for my uh, unprofessionalism here. It's uh, very, very windy out here, so I can't really have things all that great. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 says, But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. 
The truth? Yeah, that's right. Verse 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Oh, you don't have to change. You can just get saved and pray a prayer and you're in you're into heaven. Sure, keep telling yourself that. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. It says here, lie, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Do you want revival? Can you experience revival? Well, if you get saved, that's the first form of revival. You have been revived. You are a dead child of wrath on your way to hell. God's judgment is upon you. You get saved and you are quickened. You are brought alive. And now you don't have to serve sin anymore. You now have a the Holy Spirit within you that comes in and says, okay, clean that up, clean this up, clean that up. You now have the quickening. You're now made alive. You have experienced true biblical revival. That's how it starts. And that's why I, I hear a lot of this thing about we need revival in our country. I hear a lot of it. Here in America, I'm sure it goes on in the UK, I'm sure it goes on in Australia and all the other countries out there. I'm sure that there are people, apostate church buildings that are saying we need to have revival. And the sad part, like I said earlier, is a lot of them haven't even experienced the first revival. They're dead. You know, it's kind of like there are a bunch of zombies walking around going, revival, revival. Well, you're dead. You can't be revived until you're born again. Watch out for zombie Christians. Okay? There are zombie Christians out there that look like the world. They, they are totally they're the same as the lost world. But they profess to be saved. See? They're false. It's fake. And when they call for revival and say, I believe revival is coming to America... Yeah, sure. Right. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. Apparently the cardinal over here doesn't like my preaching. Maybe he's a modern Christian. Just kidding. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, it says here, While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge, notice it says knowledge, these people aren't truly saved, they are not true converts, they have the knowledge, the head knowledge, okay? Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You know what a lot of these modern Christians are? They receive head knowledge. They're told, well, of course you're a Christian. You prayed a prayer. You're an active member of the church. And what happens is they clean up their lives because that's what they do in their little building that they go to. And yet they go right back to the world and they start to justify, well, I, I don't think it's really a sin. I'm not going to go to hell if I watch an R-rated movie. And, uh, you know... I'm not going to go to hell if I do this, and if, I'm not going to go if I to hell if I you know drink and get drunk once in a while. I mean, just once in a while on holidays, and I mean I, you know, and pretty soon they justify all the sins of the lost world because they themselves are lost. But the bad part of it is the latter end is worse with them than at the beginning. 
Why? It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. You see, because now you have somebody that believes that they are saved. So when you try to witness to them, they say, How dare you judge me? I'm a Christian. Who are you to judge me? I got saved. I'm a Christian. I know Jesus Christ. Who are you to judge me? Yeah. Have you run into those? Have you seen some zombie Christians in your life? People that are walking around and they're actually dead? Mm-hmm. I know a bunch of them. All right. And let me just say this to you, Christian. If you are truly saved, you know what kind of person you were as the old man. You know what kind of things you struggled with as the old man. You better bury that old man, put that old man to death. The Bible says that you're to present your body as a living sacrifice unto God. Holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You better bury the old man and keep that old man buried and don't go visit the grave site. Okay? You say, well, what happens if you do? Revelation chapter 2. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that, hath, he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Okay, look out for this apostle movement among the charismatics. Verse 3, And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Did you know that that can happen to you as a Christian, a truly saved Christian? You can be doing good, you can be walking in newness of life, new creature and everything, doing what the Lord is telling you to do, and you can leave your first love. And I'm going to show you here coming up the best way to do that, if you're interested. Being sarcastic, people. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to, unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You know what repent means? Okay. I'm walking this way. Stop. Turn around and walk the opposite direction. You walk into the bar, stop. Turn around and walk away. You walk in towards the adult section in the bookstore, stop. Turn around, walk the other way. You walk in towards a modern church, just to visit, you know, because they have some really good programs and things there, you know. Stop, turn around, and walk the other way. Repent. That's what it means. You say, well, uh, how could I resurrect my old man? You know, I mean, if you're really interested, if you want to make a mess of your life as a Christian, here are 13 ways that you can do that. 13 easy steps to resurrect your old man and to make a mess of your life as a Christian and to show up at the judgment seat of Christ with nothing. Here's what you do. Number one, put down your King James Bible and read newspapers magazines or new versions instead. That's the best thing that you can do to bring up the old man. Number two, pray only at meals and maybe not even then. Okay? And a good repetitious prayer is a good thing. You know, just repeat the same thing every time you pray for a meal. That'll get you away from the Lord. Number three, listen to the world's music. The heavier the beat, the better. That'll help, you know. Number four, Watch television and rent movies from Hollywood. Yeah. 
Number five, stop passing out tracts and witnessing. Just say, well, I don't really feel I'm called into that kind of thing, you know. Don't read verses about that, you know, the Lord's committed unto you the ministry of reconciliation, you know. You know, we're ambassadors for Christ. Avoid that stuff, okay? Just pretend that it's a missionary in a foreign country or a pastor's job of a church building to go and witness to the lost. It's not your responsibility. Convince yourself of that. You'll make a wreck of your life. Number six, take a light attitude towards sin and become indifferent to what God in his word calls abomination. Just say, well, it's uh, actually just an alternate lifestyle. You know, they're born that way. Mm -hmm. Number seven, stop exercising and start eating processed food. You say, whoa, ho what? Hold on here. Is that really something that's scriptural? Yeah. Paul says that you're to keep under your body and bring it into subjection, lest you be a castaway. Did you know that bodily exercise profiteth little? It is in there. But what happens as a Christian, when you start to mess around with your health, things start to fall apart. You're not going to have the ability to read the Bible and pray and things like that when you're in poor health, real poor health, not because of something going wrong in your life and you have a sickness or a disease. I'm talking because of your diet. You say, I, I don't know, Brian, I think you're kind of getting off base here. Okay. You want to see proof? Go down to the local convenience store, buy a 24 pack of soda and about 30 or 40 candy bars. Now, for three days, drink soda and eat candy bars. And then tell me how good you feel and how able you are to read the Bible. Tell me about it. Oh, and it's going to get worse. Stay with it. Number eight. The eighth thing that you can do if you want to resurrect the old man and make a mess of your life as a Christian. Pick up some alcohol, cigarettes, or antidepressants to help you cope with stress. Antidepressants? Yeah, that's right. You ought to look into that sometime too and see that a lot of the antidepressants, their chemical properties are basically the same as the thing that you get on the street corner. Drugs. Illegal drugs. That's what a lot of them are. Oxycontin, they call it hillbilly heroin. Why? Because it's basically heroin in pill form. But it's okay because it's prescribed by your doctor, right? Oh yeah. Number nine, look at pornography. You say, well, I don't mess with pornographic sites on the website, you know, on the internet and things. Do you look at uh, Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition? That would have been considered pornography a hundred years ago. What about uh, National Pornographic, uh, Geographic? Well, it's okay to see a woman's uh, upper body there, you know, naked from the, the waist up, because it's scientific, you know. It's some tribe in Africa or something like this or some other tribe, some other place. And so it's okay to look at naked bodies in there because it's science, you know. Or I'll go down to the art gallery and look at some pervert that's painted a bunch of nude people, you know. There's lots of different types of pornography. Hey, you know what most television is? Pornography. Oh, it's just pretend though, right? But the Bible says to abstain from all appearance of evil. Number 10, the 10th thing that you can do to wreck your life and resurrect the old man. Try to keep up with the world's fashions and look trendy. You want to look in style when you go out? That would be important. The Bible says you're not to conform to the world. Hmm. Now I'm going to really get some of you. Number 11, Bury yourself in credit card debt, vehicle payments, and mortgages. The Bible says, owe no man anything. Hmm. The servant, or the uh, borrower is servant to the lender. Oh, but brother Brian, I have to have a, a 2013 Chevy Suburban. I mean, after all, you know, I do haul things once in a while, so I need a $50,000 vehicle. 
and my payments are affordable, I mean, right now, you know. You say, how's that going to resurrect the old man? Well, very simple, because you're going to be spending all your time trying to pay off those debts. So the Lord says, hey, how about sitting down and reading the Word here for a little bit? Oh, are you kidding me? Man, i got to get to work. i got bills to pay. Number 12, start attending a liberal church building because of the programs they offer to your family. Oh, not that. I mean, I got to have a place to take my kids. You know, I mean, we can't, you know, fellowship with other believers in a, in a home because, you know, there's no Sunday school, there's no kids program, there's no, you know, vacation Bible school. There, I mean, there, there's none of that stuff there. There's none of that stuff in here either. And a lot of King James Bible believing Christians have gone off and compromised at some church building somewhere because of their children. Programs for the kiddies. And number 13, if you're still with me, try to get along and be liked by everyone you meet. That's another good way to wreck your life as a Christian. That's a real good way. Now, if you do those 13 steps, I can guarantee you that you will wreck your life as a Christian. And you'll show up at the judgment seat of Christ with nothing. Maybe a little bit of gold or silver or something like that for something that you did for the Lord. Brethren, this book calls us to a very high standard. Why? Because the Bible says, be holy for I am holy. God is the one that spoke that. It's written instruction. Okay, it's not a suggestion. Now, I want to do a sermon at some point in the future talking about the commandments of the New Testament. You talk about, well, we, are, we don't have to live by the Ten Commandments anymore. Well, in terms of salvation, you know, to be saved, you don't have to keep Ten Commandments to be saved. But I'll tell you something, there are probably thousands, I, I never counted it, I don't know, but there are hundreds of thousands of commandments for a New Testament Christian. And be ye holy, for I am holy, is one of your commandments as a Christian. Hmm. The Bible says you're not to be conformed to the world. That's another commandment. Something to think about. But you say, brother, I, I got to admit to you, I've, I've fallen into some of these sins. And, you know, I'm not preaching to you as a perfect man. I mean, you know, sit down, you know, don't get excited. I mean... I have problems, I have sin, I have, I have issues and things like that. I mean, we're in the flesh, brethren. You're going to struggle from here till you get to go to be with the Lord. Which is why you should want the rapture, by the way. Because temptation to sin is over when we get called up to be with Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't you want that today? But what if you have fallen into sin? You're guilty of one of those 13 things I just listed right there and you've gotten away from the Lord, you're out of fellowship with the Lord, and you know you're doing things, you know you're in sin, messing around with stuff that you know you need to get rid of. What if you are in that position? Does the Bible actually use the term revive? Yeah. I think it's eight references in the King James Bible to the word revive. We're going to look them up. Psalm 85, verse 2. Psalm 85, 2 through 7. It says here, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Now this is speaking to Israel, but how much more true is this for us today as Christians? We are definitely God's people. Verse 3, Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Revive us again. You know that, that old hymn? Can you be revived as a Christian? If you've fallen into sin, if you have resurrected that old man and now you're walking along buddy-buddy with your old man, can you be revived? Yes. You can experience revival first when you get saved, but then after you get 
saved and you get out of fellowship with the Lord, you can experience personal revival. Turn next to Psalm 138. Psalm 138, verses 6 and 8. 6 through 8, excuse me. It says here, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. You're the work of God's hands. You say, well, I have gotten to my, myself to this point in my life because of my sheer talent and education. Yeah, God looks down and he says, yeah, I know the proud are far off. I can see your issues are pride, so I'm just going to have to keep chasing in you a little bit. No, God's mercy comes on the lowly. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, before the Lord. You're supposed to humble yourself. Bring yourself down. Be lowly. You know the first thing you need to do if you're messing around with sin? If you're messing around with the old man? Repent. Turn. Change direction. And then get low before God. Understand who you're dealing with. Understand that you're dealing with a God that knows your thoughts. That should scare you. Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57 verse 15. This is the next uh, time that the word revival shows up. Isaiah 57 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Don't think that you're going to experience revival in your pride. You know, and right after 9-11, I've cut on this thing before, I'll say it one more time. Right after 9-11 here in America, there was all these cars with a bumper sticker, power of pride, showed an American flag, you know, da -da -da. You know, I'm proud to be an American, you know, and all this stuff. And God's going to come in and revive a nation like this? That's in their pride? Wrong. Wrong. And you know why America hasn't been destroyed yet? It's because of Bible-believing Christians that have humbled themselves. That are keeping themselves down and not getting too high and mighty. And not thinking that they are so powerful and so whatever... Don't fall for the thing of pride. And I'll tell you what, there's not one good reference to pride or proud in this book. And your speech should be based on Scripture. Okay? So when you say, boy, I sure am proud of... What's the Bible word? Well pleased. And I'll tell you what, my wife and I, we've been working on that thing for months now, you know, and it's very difficult. You say, you know, hey, that's really good. I'm so proud. Oop. Well pleased with you. You know, it was actually uh, on the channel here, at uh, Mitch Knup was the one that actually brought that thing up. And we've been convicted about that since then. Don't use the word pride or proud. All right? Get that thing out of your mouth. You should be well pleased or blessed. Okay? Use Bible terms. Use Bible words. Very important. Turn next to Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Hosea 6, verse 1 through 3 says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. You see that? Perfect definition. You say, I need to have a dictionary to understand this King James Bible. It's too archaic. It's too hard to understand. Right there. 
the word revive is, is defined in, in verse 2 there. He will revive us. In the third day, He will raise us up and we shall live in His sight. Right there is the definition of revive. You're raised up and you are now living. You were dead, now you've been revived. Isn't that wonderful? Verse 3, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord His going forth is prepared as the morning, and He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. So again, humble yourself before God if you are in sin, and He will revive you. All right, and let me tell you what, you can get so fellowship out, you can get so out of fellowship, excuse me, with the Lord that you're going to feel like you're dead. You're going to feel like, is God, does God even care anymore? I mean, I'm so far away from the Lord and whatever. Repent. Turn from the sins that have got you out of fellowship with the Lord. Okay? Humble yourself. Go back to the Lord and He'll revive you. He will restore that relationship that you have lost. Okay, and I don't mean you lost your salvation, all right? You're just out of fellowship. You aren't going to lose your salvation right now in the church age. Very important to get. Turn next to Hosea chapter 14, verse 4. Hosea 14, verse 4 through 9. It says here, here I will hear... Let me start over. I will heal their backsliding. Are you a backslidden Christian? God will heal you. I will heal their, their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. Who is wise and he shall understand these things? Prudent and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right and the just shall walk in them. But the transgressors shall fall therein. You want to continue in sin because grace can abound as a Christian right now? God forbid. You continue in sin, God's going to have to punish you. If you are a transgressor, you'll fall. If you're proud, you will fall. Okay? The just shall walk in the commandments of the Lord. You better learn to live according to this book. You better do what God tells you to do. All right? When you do, it's a blessed life. You don't have to think, I'm going to be down here and just suffer as a Christian all my life. You don't have to suffer. I mean, you're going to suffer in this world as far as people persecuting you. But what I'm saying is, you can have a good life down here. You can enjoy coming out into nature. You can enjoy a measure of good health if you do things the Bible way. You can enjoy that fellowship that comes from being right with God. You don't have to struggle with sin all your life. You know? And, and struggle and struggle, not get victory over it and all this other stuff. You don't have to do that. Alright? God has set a prescription for a healthy life out there. You can accept it. And yeah, you're still going to be hated by the world. Yeah, you're still going to struggle with sin. Yeah, you know, all that stuff. I understand that but you can live a much better life than if you just mess around with sin your whole life and get kicked by God from here to eternity. You don't have to do that. Turn next to Habakkuk. Habakkuk 3, chapter 3, verse 2. Next time that the word revive shows up, right here it says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath remember mercy. Okay? You want God to remember mercy when you're messing around with sin. You don't want his wrath. But it's interesting because I actually left off the first time that the word revive shows up in the Bible for a reason. And that is, we have seen now two types of revival. 
First of all, you have the lost becoming saved. They're dead in trespasses and sins. They're raised up and they walk now in newness of life. They are born again. That's the first revival. The second revival is a Christian that's gotten out of fellowship with the Lord. They've left their first love. You can experience revival by coming back, repenting, humbling yourself before God, getting things fixed up, and getting back in fellowship with the Lord. That's the second type of revival. But what about corporate revival within a Christian church? Okay, a group of Christians. Again, we're not talking about a building here. We're talking about a group of Christians. Can there be corporate revival? This is very interesting. Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. This is the first time that the word revive shows up in your King James Bible. Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. It says here, But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. The lost will do that if you're saved. You know, Verse 2, And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Now look at this. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Huh. It's very interesting. Will they revive the stones? Turn in your Bible, if I can ever get the pages apart here. Turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at what these stones, what the New Testament tie into that is. Can you revive the stones? First Peter chapter 2 verse 5 says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You see, brethren, the church in the New Testament is made up of people. And when those people get together, they build up into a spiritual house. The church edifies each other. They encourage one another. You know, they're built up a spiritual house. And what Christians have done is they've gone over to the side of paganism and they've said, okay, you have your temples of worship, so we'll build that and then call it a church. And so it just makes a whole big problem, and I've talked about that in other studies. I can't get into it here. But the fact of the matter is, we are lively stones. Can you revive a group of Christians? Let me ask you a question. Out there, you people out there that watch this channel, and that watch other Bible-believing channels out there, have you experienced growth as a Christian as a result of the people here on YouTube that preach out of this book? Have you experienced revival? I get emails all the time, people saying that they've learned more from my channel in, in a, a month or two than they've learned in 30, 40 years of going to a church building someplace. What is that? That's revival. Corporate revival. A lot of the subscribers on this channel, and I'm not just saying it's all here, I'm, I'm the center for the revival. No, I'm not saying that. There are a lot of Bible believers out there that are putting out some really, really good preaching. And there are Christians, modern Christians that come into the thing and they're going to these big modern churches, they're using new versions, and they hear the truth for the first time that that hireling coward at their building is afraid to preach. And they hear the truth from men here on YouTube and they say, wow. And they watch another video and they watch another video and they watch another video. And next thing you know, they're going out and they're buying a King James Bible. They're getting rid of their... Christian, you know, their CCM music, they're, they're changing their standards and things like that. They're starting to witness. They experience revival. Not because they were resurrecting and live, the old man and living in sin. No, just because they were deceived. The church right now, the Christian church, the lively stones, all right, they've been having trouble. 
back in the past because you were pretty much, you know, if you wanted to go to church someplace or you get saved and whatever else, you'd pick a building in your area somewhere and you'd go there and you sit under some guy's ministry and you might sit there for 50 years and never hear the truth. But there's a massive revival going on right now. Brethren, there are people listening to these sermons and you're out there right now, you're probably nodding your head, that are in countries where Christian ministries, Christian missionaries and things, they can't get in. But through YouTube, we get in. You can hear preaching from a King James Bible through YouTube that you'd never be able to have. I couldn't go over there and say, I'd like to come into your country and preach the Word of God. You know, Communist China, United Arab Emirates, Korea, a lot of these places forbid, Pakistan forbid preaching of the Word of God. You couldn't go in there, First Baptist Church of Pakistan, and eh, wrong. You'd get killed so quick you wouldn't know what hit you. But through YouTube, the body of Christ out there, the true body of born-again believers, that true body can experience revival corporately. And right now, the Bible-believing movement on YouTube, I believe, is growing. You say, wait a second, then you're saying that there's revival coming? No, what I'm saying is, among a very small portion of the populace, there is revival. Christians that have never heard about the Bible version issue. Christians that have never heard about dispensationalism. Christians that have never heard about creation science. About whatever. All these different issues. Christians are being educated through this internet ministry. More so than any building out there is going to be able to do. Most buildings might reach two or three hundred people in their local community. Maybe a couple thousand. On YouTube, it's up into the millions. Millions and millions of people. Can the church experience corporate revival? Yes. Yeah. By coming to the truth. Not by accepting the world's ways and drawing more of the lost in to get their money. That's not revival. Okay. That is definitely not revival. But you say... How could I really have real strong revival in my life? I need personal revival. Let's go back to the thing of you're a Christian, you're out of fellowship with God, you want to have personal revival. What's the number one quoted portion of Scripture in your King James Bible that people will turn you to? 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. This is the one they'll say, you know, we need revival. Let's, let's, we need a mighty revival in the land. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. And I'm going to show you that a text without a context is a pretext. All right, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I'll even get charismatic for you because I know how people love that out there and stuff. You know, I'm going to get charismatic. I'm really going to put some emotion into it because, you know, we shouldn't be logical. You know, let's not reason together. Let's just be emotional and just let our feelings be our guide. Here's how you read it emotionally. Ready? If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I heal, hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Oh, if we could only turn, brother. Uh -huh. Yeah, see, that's the way they'll read it, to appeal to your emotions. But you see, you have to get the context of the chapter. You say, what are you talking about? Look at verse 5. You see, that change, that revival that comes, that national revival, that big revival that people want so bad, it comes only after this. Verse 5, And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of twenty and two thousand oxen and an hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. I wonder what the market value would be. I think I might have even looked this up years ago in one of my older sermons, but I don't remember now, of, uh, what is that? Sacrifice of 20 and 2,000 oxen. 22,000 oxen. That's a lot of cattle. 22,000 head of cattle. You know, oh boy. And then 120,000 sheep. 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. Burn. Don't you know that that would be quite a sacrifice? Don't you know that that costs the people 
something? Hmm. So in other words, a sacrifice isn't really a sacrifice unless it costs you something? Kind of like the widow's mite. She didn't have that money to give, but she sacrificed it to the Lord. Hmm. Very interesting. And you say, well, that's Old Testament though, brother. We don't have to sacrifice anything anymore by fire. We don't ever have to do that. Turn to Acts chapter 19. Do I believe burnt offerings are for the New Testament Christian? Yes, I do. You say, oh, come on, brother. You never did a burnt offering, did you? Yes, I did. Say, you burn an animal? No. But I'm going to show you what I did burn. Acts chapter 19, verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Wait a second. They confessed and showed their deeds? Kind of like did works for meat for repentance? Oh, no. Well, this obviously is a false doctrine. Let's just put the Bible down and just go walk away and, and, you know, go eat some candy or something like that. They confessed. They showed their deeds. They changed. Verse 19. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Hmm. 50,000 pieces of silver. I don't know how big those pieces of silver were but that would be worth some money right now. You know, silver right now is like $22 and some odd cents an ounce. You know, as of late May 2013. It's gone down quite a bit but you know the point is that's a lot of money. Wouldn't they have been better served by selling their sinful things on eBay? Or by taking them to a second-hand store or having a yard sale or something like that? No, they burned them. And what was the result of that? Verse 20, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Hmm. Sounds like revival. Comes after a burnt sacrifice. You say, okay, brother, you're losing me here. Bring it up to date. Let's make this applicable to 2013 as I'm preaching this. Okay? Let's do that. Do you have any Hollywood movies in your house? There by the TV, that DVD rack? Do you have any movies with profanity? Do you have any movies with nudity? Do you have any movies where they mock God or blaspheme God? Would you feel comfortable sitting down, the Lord comes and knocks on your door, and you say, hey, Lord, come on in, pick a DVD. You say, oh, well, <laughs> some of them probably not. What are you doing with them? You want to get some revival in your life? How about a burnt sacrifice? Burn it. You say, well, brother, I, I spent a lot of money on them things. I mean, come on here, you know. I mean... I, if you have things in there, and I'm not saying, you know, people get, again, oh, he's saying that anything secular is evil. No, I'm not saying that. Okay, there are some old things that go way back, you know, and, and, and they're not bad. They don't have bad messages in them and stuff like that. There's no profanity. It's just about nature or whatever else like that. Whatever, okay? Discernment, brethren, I mean, come on, you know. But if you know that the thing is wrong, if you know that it's rated R or some kind of thing like that, and it's got profanity and it's got God being blasphemed in it and stuff, burn it. Don't let the thing stick around. And I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to tell you about one of the burnt offerings that we have been doing. A lot of my new versions that I had. I've had some brethren write me and say, you know, you really shouldn't have those things around. They're an abomination to God. And so what have I been doing? I've been slowly burning the ones that I don't need, the ones that I'm not going to make videos on exposing them. And when I do make videos on the ones that I need to expose, I'm going to burn them. You say, well, brother, that's cost you a lot of money, isn't it? That's the point. Offering up spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. Burn it. If something has caused you to be out of fellowship with God, burn it. Show the Lord you're serious. 
pretty high standards, aren't they? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, you say, well, what about a national revival? Are we headed for national revival? Let's look about that. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Now this deals with, and of course a lot of you already know where I'm going with this, but for those of you who are new to this, you know, a lot of people try to say that the whole thing out there calling themselves Christian, that we're all headed for a revival. I'm going to show you that doesn't work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Two things have to happen before the Antichrist is revealed. Number one, there has to be, let's see there, it says, there shall come away, or, I'm sorry, there shall come a, excuse me, I said that wrong. Two things have to happen before Jesus Christ comes back, okay? The church has to fall away, there has to be a great apostasy, and the Antichrist has to be revealed. And it goes on to say about the thing that's withholding the Antichrist has to be taken out of the way. What is that? That's the church. The body of Christ, okay? The Holy Spirit indwelling the body of Christ. That has to leave. Doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is totally gone from the earth for the time of Jacob's trouble. Not true, okay? Again, watch other studies I've done on that. But the point is, there's a falling away. Not a great, mighty revival. The churches, what is called church out there, Christian, the Christianity, I'll say it that way, has not gotten better in the last... 30, 40 years. It's falling apart. Don't fall for this thing of, oh, I think it's getting better. I think times are getting better. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm just going to hit a couple more scriptures here today before we're done. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I had a guy write to me and he said, uh, there's no scripture saying that the Christian church is going to get worse. Okay? The Bible does not teach. There's, it's all just the world gets worse. There's nothing saying that the church gets worse. Well, I just showed you one. Here's another. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And you can go on to read there about, you know, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat. You know, meats. But the point is there, it says some shall depart from the faith. That doesn't mean, well, everybody else is doing it, so I have to as well. You know, No, you don't have to depart from the faith. Some will, but you don't have to. You can be one of those few that actually makes it to the rapture and be found faithful when Jesus Christ catches us away. Make sure you, found, you are found faithful. Make sure that you love His appearing. Be looking for Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. Very, very important also. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. You know what's kind of interesting? Where does your power come from as a Christian? From your own talent? From your own skill? No. Your power comes from Jesus Christ. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. Okay? Being made conformable to His death. The fellowship of, and receiving the fellowship of his sufferings. I'm messing that verse all up. It's in Philippians. But the point is, the power that comes upon you, the power of Christ's resurrection, is when you're conformable to his death. When you crucify the old man. When you say, I don't want anything to do with the old life. Alright? There are three stages of revival for a Christian. Salvation. When you are dead in trespasses and sins and you're brought to life, you are born again. That's the first revival. The second revival is when you get out of fellowship with the Lord. You can be revived when you repent, when you humble yourself. You can 
experience revival. And the third type of revival is corporate revival. When you go and you say to a brother or sister, you know, you share and you say, hey, you got to see this video. This is really good. Wow, it really answers things. And you go to your, to your I shouldn't say lost, but you go to your, your family members that are messed up, that are going to modern churches and whatever else, and you go to them and you say, hey, let me show you the truth about the Bible version issue. Let me show you the truth about these other issues and things like that. And all of a sudden, you have a group of Christians there and they're learning the truth and they're growing and stuff. What are you experiencing? You are experiencing corporate revival. But are we going to see a national revival? An international revival? All the Christian churches are going to raise up here in these last days and we're going to have sweeping revivals and we're going to have all kinds of things happen. Uh-uh. That is what I was rebuking in my other sermon. We are not heading towards revival nationally. You see, because what most people call revival out there, it means that all these church buildings out there are going to be reawakened and that they're going to go out and America is going to go back to being a peaceful, prosperous type of a place. That's not biblical revival. That's carnal. Okay? That's all it is. You know, America's headed down. The UK is headed down. All the nations are headed down. Why? Because there's a one world government coming. You can't have some kind of a peaceful place where it's all wonderful and great and everything and that, and that somehow will get through the time of Jacob's trouble and, and you know, no, no. Everything is headed down. Okay? Every dispensation ends in apostasy. Every single one of them. That is what I was rebuking. Okay? Can a Christian experience revival? Yes. Yes. And if you are out of fellowship with God and you know that there are things in your life, things in your house that you shouldn't have, burn them. And you say, but brother, I would lose hundreds of dollars. Mm -hmm. I used to have a lot of CCM things. I'll just give you a little testimony here, a little word of testimony. I used to have a lot of Christian rock, heavy metal, even some rap, believe it or not. I used to have some of that. And when I first, when I learned the truth, you know, when I got saved and I was, you know, reading and believing the King James Bible and I got on uh, Terry Watkins, Dr. Terry Watkins' website, uh, contending, or uh, not contending, Dial the Truth Ministries, av1611.org. I got on there and I started seeing these articles against, you know, the modern Christian rock that I loved so much. And I started to read these articles kind of skeptically at first. But I started to read them and I realized, oh boy, the Lord does not want me to have this music. This music is causing me to be out of fellowship with the Lord. And I had, I had literally probably a couple thousand dollars worth of CDs. I mean, stacks and stacks and stacks of them. You know what I did with them? And nobody even told me. I couldn't have turned there to Acts chapter 19. I couldn't have turned to that thing to save my life. I didn't even know. But it was just a natural thing. I took those CDs out and I burned them. I didn't say, well, let me see. Maybe I can get a lot of good money for these things. I knew it was wrong. I said, I'm burning them. Recently, this past couple of months ago, my wife and I, we were living up there in McKean County. Uh, we started going through our DVDs and through our books. And we started saying, Lord, do you want us to have this? Lord, do you want us to keep this? Is this cutting off fellowship between us and you? And you know what? The Lord really convicted us, convicted our hearts on a couple of those. And I'm not just saying, a couple, I should say boxes of books and DVDs that we had. The Lord convicted us. And I said, you know what? Let's burn this stuff. And we went out and we burned it. And we sang hymns while we were burning it. While that stuff's going up in smoke. Sitting there hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stuff just burning up into smoke. You say, what's happened since then? The Lord's blessed us tremendously. It's just, it's such a neat thing to sacrifice something to the Lord and to see His blessing, to see Him come in and work. What did we experience? Revival. You can experience revival yourself. But it's going to cost you something. It will cost. Revival is not possible without sacrifice. 
It's just as simple as that. So that's going to be the sermon on revival. Yes, you can have revival. Yes, there can be revival. Yes, it is something that's scriptural. But this thing of national revival and coming back to the way things used to be and all that other stuff can't happen. It's not going to happen. Why? Because the Bible says so. It's not my opinion. All right? That's the way it is. And brethren, let me just say this in closing. This ministry is about this book. I am a King James Bible believer. This is the standard. I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about your emotions. I don't care that I've offended you or whatever else. It's the book. The book is the standard. And if you can show me from the book where I'm wrong, and I see it and I say, oh yeah, wow, and you're not taking the verse out of context or messing with it or whatever, I'll change. You know, I've done it in the past. I've come out and publicly said when I'm wrong. But Christianity requires a new birth. You cannot expect to go on living in trespasses and sins. To go on living as a dead man. You have to come to God and be born again. Ye must be born again. And if you have not been born again, if you can't really say that things have changed for you, then you need to get saved. You aren't saved if you've never been born again. It's as simple as that. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, I can't judge the sins of, the, of your people out there personally. I, I don't know. I'd have to be in their homes. I'd have to search through their things, Lord, and that's not scriptural. Uh, they need to judge themselves, Lord. I can preach your word, but I'm not going to be their, their official pope or something that's going to proclaim things for them. Lord, I believe in a New Testament priesthood. Your Bible teaches a New Testament priesthood. And every man out there has to be a priest in his own home. And the women out there too, Lord, if they don't have a husband to rule over them or, or if their husband's not saved, they themselves can still read the Bible, read your word, and they can know what's right and wrong if they're genuinely saved. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd go out there and that you would speak to each of your people out there and convict them of the sins that are in their lives. Convict them, Lord, of those things that have cut off that fellowship, those things that they need to, to burn that they need to get rid of to restore that right relationship, Lord, to experience true biblical revival. I pray, Lord, for the people out there that they would humble themselves before you, Lord, not before me. Don't, that would be ridiculous. Uh, but, Lord, if there's people out there that are too proud to humble themselves, Lord, I pray that, that well, you'd have to do with what you have to do with them. I really can't say much more. They, you just would abase their pride is the whole thing. But I pray, Lord, that you would want, that you would make everybody out there that's listening to this, that they would want to have that right relationship with you, that they would want to have that real true fellowship, that real true reviving that can only come through repentance, through a humbled spirit, and through sacrifice. And so, Lord, I just... Uh, pray for your blessing upon those out there that are preaching the word, that are getting things out in ministry, that are going out tracting, that have experienced revival and they're continuing, Lord, with their first love. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them and continue to encourage them to, con and to keep at it as things get worse. And so I just ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.